Hi, this is Rush Limbaugh, author and narrator of the audiobook Rush Revere and the First Patriots. The reason that I wanted to write a children's series was to do something different. There are conservative manifesto books galore that are throughout the market, and I was being urged by our good friend Vince Flynn to write another. And I felt I've been there, done that. The market was crowded and populated with a lot of these other books. And my wife said, well, you know, you really care about what kids are being taught. She pointed out to me that I'm very worried about education in the public school system that isn't truthful, isn't honest about American history and specifically the founding of the country. And I think it's crucial that Americans understand that. So I love this country. There is a concept that I call American exceptionalism that can be explained very simply. It's not that we're better people. It's not that we're smarter. It's not that our DNA is better than anybody else. It's that we are the exception to the rule. Most of the people born and lived in this world have lived under tyranny, authoritarianism, in poverty. We are the exception to that. And we are exceptional because our freedom was documented and codified in our founding documents as having come from God, from a creator, not from other men, not from another government. We are born that way. We in this country are born with the attitude that everything's legal, everything's cool. And then we have laws that we participate in writing that say what isn't legal and what isn't proper. Other people born in the world are born with the idea that nothing is legal, that everything is illegal until a government comes along and says you can do it. And I think this country stands out in any which way you want to measure in such a short period of time compared to the lifespan of other countries. And there's a reason why we became a superpower. And that's why we are exceptional. And it is my fervent desire to inculcate that and teach it to as many people as possible. I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of the way I was raised. I'm proud of my country and I want everybody to be. So writing this book, this series of children's books is an effort. I mean, 10 to 12 year olds, 13 year olds are not gonna listen to my radio program, but their parents and their grandparents might. Yet I want them to be aware. I want them to know the things I believe, the values that I believe in. And this is a way to get it to them. The audio versions of these books, word for word, not abridged. The audio version read by me is a way to take the book in another way. Even people younger than 10 who may not be able to read it yet, but could certainly listen to it and enjoy it and learn from it. What I hope people take away from it is love of country. I hope they really enjoy the story. I hope they're fascinated with some of the things they learn. And I hope they come away with pride, and great appreciation for the people that made this country possible. There were some tremendous people, great people, who underwent overwhelming odds, experienced real hardship, unknown to people alive today. And they did it for a cause. They did it for a simple thing, freedom. And if in the right places, or wrong as it may be, if you start making a big deal about freedom, some people might laugh at you. Oh, come on, Rush, we're not losing our freedom, yet we are. Gradually and slowly in ways that are sometimes imperceptible. It's my desire to educate as many people as I can to the concept of freedom and the sacrifices that our founding fathers and everybody, the sacrifices that they made and endured to establish, create, and bequeath this great country to us. As far as a favorite character to give voice to in the series, I can tell you that Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims, the favorite character from all the fan mail that we're getting is the talking horse Liberty. The young readers of the first book absolutely love that character. And that helped in crafting the second book and maintaining the uh, characteristics of that character of the talking horse that the kids loved so much. But I tell you, this second book, it was a challenge and it was also something I couldn't wait to do. 
you know, we're trying to teach in this book, but it isn't political. You're not going to see the word Republican or Democrat or liberal or conservative anywhere in the book. This is not ideological instruction in any way. Yet, it is my hope that through various techniques, I can nevertheless instruct, inform, or teach while entertaining the various concepts. So one of the devices that I chose in Rush Revere and the First Patriots was Rush Revere, time traveling back and actually having a conversation with King George, who was, in modern terminology, the tyrant, who was maintaining the colonists in America in a very oppressive manner. And by having Revere in a deep conversation, almost a debate, it was my desire to have the king explain what he thought of the colonists, how little he thought of them, how they were nothing but subjects, that his power was absolute, and they were nothing but slaves or servants, and they didn't know what was good for them. They were unable to make the choices necessary to do what's right in life. Only he and his government knew, and he wanted them dependent on him. That was his source of power. It is a conversation that I was a focal point of the book, and it was a crucial part of the book in terms of being able to write it in such a way that young people between the age of 10 and 13 would grasp what I wanted them to grasp from it. And that is the whole notion of a tyrannical or statist oppressive government versus individual liberty and freedom. I'm very curious to see how that is received and how it is reacted to. The most fun part of the recording is the challenge of making every page sound like it's the first page I'm reading to avoid getting into monotony. I don't want anybody to be bored. It's to maintain the passion, maintain the enthusiasm, uh, character differentiation without actually changing voices. There's a little bit of that, but I don't do impersonations per se, and I don't actually sing uh, the songs because I'm deaf and I use a cochlear implant to hear, so I, I really have a tough time creating melody. I can follow melody if I hear it, but uh, creating it out of nothing is tough for me because I don't hear the range uh, to be able to know if I'm doing it right. But it's a challenge, all the different voices and making sure that the end of every page is a page turner and every chapter is people left hanging. I wanted to go into radio, honestly, because I hated school. I literally despise it. I have post-traumatic stress disorder to this day, thinking about being pigeonholed in a classroom. It was prison, especially if the classroom had windows and I could see everybody going about their lives freely and, and nobody telling them where they had to be as far as I knew. And I just, I get, getting ready for school every morning, my mother had the radio on and the guy on the radio sounded like he was really having fun. He was really happy to be alive. He was really happy to be awake and up and that's the last thing I felt. I mean, I was being forced to go into prison, and I wanted to be like this guy on the radio. And I had a natural proclivity for music and playing it for other people DJ-wise. So that's the short version of uh, why I wanted to get into radio. I also value radio much more than television because I think radio done well is more influential and can have more impact than television. Now, Television, obviously, with pictures, I'm not going to argue how much impact it has, but with a radio audience, they're not using their sense of sight. You've got to grab their attention some other way. You have to either paint the picture for them or be creative or provocative enough that they create their own mental picture. But if you do it right, you have their full attention. Spoken word radio, if done well, there's nothing going on in the background they're listening to. Music on the radio, you can be doing all kinds of things with the music on in the background. The same thing with the television. You have a TV show in the background, you'll be doing other things. But spoken word, format radio, if it's done right, you own the audience. You have a very active audience relationship as opposed to 
passive. And I might say, I might add here, that some of the things I try to achieve in the audio version of the book is to be so dominant and so good at it that that's all people are doing when they're listening to the book. There's nothing else going on. that They're riveted. If you achieve that, then everything else you need to do business-wise, everything else flows naturally from that. That's why accomplishing it, I can't tell you the number of people that I've known who've been on TV, they anchor the news or whatever, and they've been asked to guest host a radio talk show. And they're fascinated after they finish because people who heard their show tell them what they heard them say, and they comment on what they heard them say. And people on TV are not used to that. They're used to people telling them what they thought of their makeup, or their tie, or their appearance in general, their clothes or what have you, or what else they saw on TV. That's the great thing about radio. It's why I love it so much. And that's what I try to accomplish. Same thing here with the audio books.